Welcome back everyone. This week we're going to be discussing Vario Growth, ticker symbol VREOF. Once again, practically nobody is paying attention. Once again, I find myself in isolation. As everyone is talking about Florida, here I am talking about Minnesota. Let me put this in perspective for you. On a recent episode of the Cannabis Investing Podcast, the interviewee Jesse Redman discussed the Florida, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Minnesota markets. Yet, as you'll soon see, the depth of analysis differs. Let me show you the diligence, or lack thereof, being done in regards to Minnesota, and by extension its constituent MSOs, versus other states and operators. As far as I'm concerned, Mr. Redman's overview is reflective of the general industry's focus, or lack thereof, and thus is the reason I'm citing it. He went on to detail the following. Florida has 22 million residents, 137 million tourists. The medical market is $1.8 billion, almost 500 MSO-owned stores. He goes on to detail that Consortium has 35 out of 38 stores in Florida, Planet 13 has 26 out of their 30 stores in Florida, Air has 67 out of 94, and True Leaf has 70% of their stores in Florida. Then he goes on to note Pennsylvania, with 13 million people living there, a medical market between $1.5 and $2 billion, 132 MSO-owned stores. Adult use is being done through a legislative process rather than a vote. Best guess is mid to late 2025 start for adult use. And that True Leaf is the leader with 21 stores. Jushi has 17 stores, which compromises 47% of stores being in Pennsylvania and that they have a 131,000 square foot cultivation facility. And finally, Cresco has 15 stores, which accounts for 21% of their retail footprint. Then, before he got to Minnesota, he discussed Ohio. He noted that adult sales are starting, the maximum number of doors allowed is five, and tier one grow operators have better margins due to being vertically integrated, but also because they're allowed to participate in the wholesale market. Also, by having a Tier 1 grow, they're allowed an additional three stores. He noted that operations with five stores in a Tier 1 grow were GTI, Cresco, Cannabis, and Acreage. Operators with four stores in a Tier 1 grow is Vexed, <clears throat> and that operators with five stores in a Tier 2 grow are Verano and Ascend. And then Minnesota. Spot the difference of analysis, if you will. Hemp. Derived market edibles and beverages are allowable up to 5 milligram servings, 10 per pack, as well as THC beverages on tap. He says, and I and quote, I don't think Minnesota on a total MSO basis is going to be super meaningful. It will impact GTI and Vario Health, or is it Vario Growth these days? I forget the proper name, but those two stand out as having Minnesota exposure, end quote. So to sum it up, it's hemp, 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 hemp. Talk tons about hemp. She talked about hemp, 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 hemp. And then just a quick marginalizing and brushing over of, uh, yeah, yeah, GTI and Vario growth. They'll be involved. And, but in the aggregate totalitarian approach of all MSOs, not that meaningful. It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> By the order that these states and companies were discussed, as well as the subsequent lessening of information, you can tell that Minnesota isn't getting much attention. You'd also think that with all the talk of THC beverages, perhaps a mention of Vario's high AF and Boundary Water branded beverage being launched in Minnesota on April 20th, 2024, would have been appropriate. So let's try this again to keep it more in line with his other analysis. Minnesota, 5.7 million people live there. Medical market is $120 million. Adult use is starting in the first half of 2025. Vario Growth and GTI are the only two vertically integrated MSOs. Minnesota is surrounded by four states, none of which have adult use. Maximum number of dispensaries allowed is eight, one per congressional district. Vario has hit their limit of eight dispensaries. Eight of their 14 dispensaries are in Minnesota, that's 57%. And if they manage to divest their New York assets, it'll go up to 80%. That's much better, isn't it? I'm not here to talk 
about the pre-February 2023 Vario. As far as I'm concerned, it was a poorly executed clusterfuck. To me, this is a turnaround play, an inflection investing opportunity. Why February 2023? Because that's when Josh Rosen became the CEO and the genesis of the cream and fire strategy happened. Do not confuse the Vario of the past with the Vario of the present or the future. A lot of money can be made from the following developments. Horribly fucked, to sort of shitty, to decent. Remember, to go from down 80 to down 60 is, well, a multi-bagger. Let alone down 80 to down 50. In the spirit of full disclosure, though, <clears throat> it can go the other direction, straight to bankruptcyville. And who knows, maybe Vario will excel past decent into a well-run, profitable, and aspiring business. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Once upon a time isn't present tense. As such, we shouldn't confuse the two, although the past is often prologue, but sometimes it's not. The past. They were in Minnesota. Still are. New York. Still are. Arizona. Pennsylvania. New Mexico. Maryland. Still are. Nevada. And Puerto Rico. And then presently... They are in Minnesota with eight dispensaries, Maryland with two dispensaries, and New York with four dispensaries, with non-operating assets and liabilities in Nevada, Puerto Rico, and Massachusetts. So that's the past, the present, and then what's the future? Well, the future is adult use. Has, well, the, the past was Maryland turning adult use, so the future is going to be them being in Maryland as well as in Minnesota, and the future of Minnesota is adult use come 2025. And who knows beyond that? Minnesota is going adult use in 2025. Yeah, that's a big deal. More than you might realize. And going off script here for a moment, is it how much of it's your fault that you don't realize? With the analysis that we started this article off with, like no one's really informing you. And then it's, I guess, up to you, but we're communal social creatures that rely on one another for information. So I can't say that I necessarily fault you if you didn't realize. You have a company that's going from illiquid and insolvent to liquid and solvent due to the restructuring of debt and the divestment of assets. You have a company brushing up against positive cash flow from operations due to Maryland turning adult use last year and Minnesota turning adult use next year. You have a company that's one of two vertically integrated companies in a state that's getting ready to boom, Minnesota. Minnesota, by many standards, has a restrictive and more heavily regulated medical market. This has caused people to get faked out into thinking that the adult use market won't be that large either. I think they're terribly mistaken. I think that adult use legalization will open the floodgates due to the suppressed and pent-up demand that didn't want to jump through regulatory hoops or couldn't qualify due to the less than lenient medical hurdles in dispensary locations. Below is a chart depicting growth expectations for when adult use turns on. Link in the description. You'll see that the projection is that this year, 2024, sales will be 130 million and in 2025 sales will be 551 million now i'll say off script that people have become dull and numb and jaded to such projections because they bought into the nonsense 2018 through 2021 let's call it so now they're discounting the reality of situations, the best that I can tell. And the reality of the situation is that that's a 323% year-over-year rise in sales. <clears throat> and seemingly, people can only think that's possible in Florida, which is interesting, but uh, is what it is. It's the consequence of self-imposed ignorance and a state of learned helplessness due to a less than flattering environment over the last half decade in this industry. If we use a sample size of one, what could go wrong with that, and examine their Maryland operation when adult use became legalized, 
we discover that they not only kept pace, but exceeded the state's total market sales. So that's worth thinking about. Images like the below make me optimistic too. <clears throat> Let me draw your attention to the east and southern flanks of Minnesota. There you'll find Wisconsin, no medical cannabis, and Iowa, a very restrictive medical state with a total of five dispensaries. And let me zoom in for those who don't know geography. This, where my mouse pointer is, is Minnesota. To the right is Wisconsin. Below it is Iowa. And then to the left, top, you have North Dakota, and then below it, South Dakota. But this is in a geography lesson, so let's move on. You'll note that the majority of their dispensaries are within a roughly 30 to 40 minute drive to the Wisconsin, most prohibitionist of surrounding states, border. That should bode well for, their, for them to an indeterminate extent. Another narrative-heavy and numbers-light consideration is how many of the THC beverage consumers might be can of curious and explore alternative form factors. Because after all, aren't low-dose hemp-derived THC beverages the real gateway drug? Being that they're only allowed one dispensary per congressional district, and that they're relocating their Moorhead dispensary, I'm curious as to where the next green goods dispensary will go. Here's a map of the congressional districts in case you're curious. The opportunity. Maryland turning to adult use allowed their gross profit margins to go from 46% to 54%. But look what happened to their EBITDA margin. It went from practically zilch to 23%. Now let's look at what the Minnesota market is doing currently, keeping in mind that's not adult use yet. Minnesota is currently 48% of revenues. <clears throat> If we simply double their first half Minnesota revenue for the year, that comes out to $46.4 million. Now let's assume that we grow, that they grow in Minnesota in line with the overall projected market growth, 323% as noted earlier. This would imply that they make $196 million in revenue. If they maintain their current EBITDA margin of 23%, although currently that's largely due to Maryland, but I'd imagine Minnesota might have similar margins, then that brings us to $45 million of EBITDA extracted out of Minnesota once they turn adult use. Thus far this year, they've made $8.13 million in EBITDA. All else being equal, and we double that, then they'll end 2024 with $16 million of EBITDA. Which is to say that they'll grow their EBITDA from $16 million to $45 million, which is a 200% growth, and that's not even factoring in Maryland in the final equation. Look, there's tons of assumptions in here. Will Maryland price compress by then, thus offsetting Minnesota gains? Will Minnesota pounds be more than Maryland pounds, thus offsetting the price compression in Maryland? After all, some suspect that a pound could go for 5000 in Minnesota, at least at the start of things, come next year. Will they have capacity to fully capitalize on a Minnesota market? Will Minnesota start late? Won't Minnesota EBITDA margins rapidly expand, thus making my estimates conservative, etc., etc., etc. Regardless, I do believe my numbers to be good enough in both direction and magnitude. I would like to compare my analysis to others' analysis, yet I can't find anyone else's analysis. The point is that they're looking to put up some big numbers in the upcoming future. Everybody is doing this sort of math, or pretending to. When it comes to Florida, and it's okay then, so why is it not now? The difference is that Minnesota isn't relying on ballot outcomes. Hell, around the cannabis space, it's practically all narrative and no numbers. But when it comes to Minnesota, the, narr the narrative gets hijacked and bastardized to hemp beverages. The narrative of big headline numbers and macro narratives that don't show the underlying math, common cannabis rhetoric, aren't even happening when it comes to Minnesota. To most, Minnesota equals hemp, the end when it should be Minnesota equals a big deal for Vario. What I'm getting at here is that people aren't paying attention. Vario growth. Insofar as Minnesota is concerned, they're allowed to co-locate their medical and recreational dispensaries, so that'll help on the CapEx side. 
Plus, as Josh Rosen pointed out in their Q1 conference call, due to the restrictive nature on the medical front, they currently can produce more than they can sell. But how much is the question and isn't a question I have an answer for. But I'll try. If growing, if growing Rogue is building 50,000 square foot facilities, which produce roughly 1,000 pounds a month on the low end, then Vireo's cultivation facility of 90,000 square feet could produce 1,800 pounds a month. That would be 21,600 pounds a year. We'll use the, 20, the Q2 2024 total flower harvested as a run rate figure for the following math. If we assume that they can keep up their Q2 poundage, that gives us 14,000 pounds a year, meaning that they theoretically have an additional capacity of 7,600 pounds or 54% potential growth. <clears throat> I see two problems with my math. I don't expect their facility to be as efficient as Grown Rogue's, although Grown Rogue is helping them where they can. And a 54% increase of production isn't going to capture much of their market if the market does indeed grow 323% year over year. Although I don't see any press releases from Vario on the matter, nor can I find it in their 10Q or conference call, there does seem to be this mythical Elk River, Minnesota cultivation facility in development. The only official mention of it I've come across is in a recent S3 filing. Of course, I didn't find the S3 filing on Virio's website like one might expect, but instead required a direct search on the company on the SEC website. Ugh. But seemingly, that's a common enough theme with smaller cap companies. I don't know if it's a, a cost issue or a hiding the past issue or what it is. <clears throat> Just like some companies keep up their investor presentations from years ago, and a lot of these small caps seem to erase them immediately, but, and then to provide ostensible reasons for why, and I, I just fundamentally don't know, so I can't really hold that against them since it's a common enough practice. <clears throat> Doing a little Googling, I found numerous articles from around March 2024 mentioning this plan, but no further updates. Here's one such site. Just like their Otsego facility, which is, I guess, 87,232 square foot greenhouse cultivation facility with an adjacent 20 acre parcel for potential expansion, I can barely find any mention or details on these matters. So with that said, I'll end this section here. Improvements. Margin improvements can be tricky because you can improve your margins without growing the underlying margin metric. For instance, you can improve EBITDA margins simply by reducing SG&A. But to see both EBITDA as well as EBITDA margins improve is a sign of improving health. You'll note that below their revenue, EBIT and EBITDA are, are, are up and to the right as well as the margins. You'll also note that SG&A margins are decreasing. This is the quintessential example of operating leverage. I'd like to think it's due to, to increases in efficiency and fixed costs being spread over a higher revenue base. Of course, Maryland starting adult use sales in July 2023 helped immensely, so I'd say it's a combination of opportunists meeting opportunities. I suspect that this chart will remain up and to the right due to Minnesota coming online in a couple of quarters. Between their divestments in other states, CEO change, the respective market turning around, grown rogue advising them, and so on, it should come as a it shouldn't come as a surprise that they're now flirting and brushing up against positive cash flow from operations as well as free cash flow, and although the net income is negative, it's less negative. I just want you to know that th their top line improvements are actually translating to bottom line improvements. Although free cash flow and net income are still negative, they're improving. Both the absolute level and the rate of change are inflecting and have been inflecting positively. I expect that to continue happening into adult legalization in Minnesota come next year. Concerns. I tried looking at the proxy statement and such for the management, for how the management is incentivized and compensated, but they seemingly don't want you to know. Now, I should put as a disclaimer here, it isn't that they don't put it in there. It's just that there's pages and pages and pages of small text. I'm not a professional. I can make sense of some of it. Some of it I can't. 
And as far as I'm concerned, those who do want to make it very clear, for instance, might show you a chart like the one on the screen currently, which is <clears throat> from Chesapeake's fiscal year 2021 compensation structure. It really lays it out in a much prettier picture. Now, it's a reductionistic and simplistic picture, but it really kind of aids you in understanding the compensation structure and how they're incentivized. It would be nice to see a chart like this in relation to their cream and fire strategy, which they're chronically mentioning. But when a criterion is based upon adjectives, it's bound to be ambiguous. But alas, another issue is that they're illiquid and insolvent. This kept me away for the longest time. One of the main reasons I'm writing this piece is because this company has redeeming qualities that seemingly no one can be bothered highlighting to any meaningful, ex meaningful or comprehensive extent in the public spaces. Besides a little note here, a little comment there, some high abstract narrative, but no numbers. People love the narratives, and, and even on the narrative front, in large part, it's been terribly disappointing of what I've seen. As I noted at the beginning of this article, you can't even count on the more prominent analysts and figureheads in this space to say much. It's often the case that the devil is in the details, but so is the saving grace. Between my superficial strategy of immediately dismissing Ill illiquid and insolvent companies and my cannabis peers failing to meaningfully communicate positive aspects of the company and what's going on, I've been slower to evaluate this company. Now, I will note in both, a, I, I don't know, a backhanded compliment way, perhaps, Aaron Edelheit on tw hilarious. So, so he posted something on Value Investor Club about goodness growth at the beginning of the year, I think February, March, something like that. And then on Twitter, <clears throat> he talks about how he, he noted how he wrote a write up on value on VIC value investor club and how he barely got any traction on it. And then, so that means someone did write it up, but it's amazing. I, I want to make a whole article about the difficulties of finding information because although it's there and if you know where to look and how to search for it you can come across it like i did in seconds but then people in the comments section were like what's vic or where can i find it or can you provide a link and i don't think he ever did which is interesting it's like i just wanted to comment on how it's getting minimal traction and then my tweet gets more comment and traction than the article did. And people are like, you, you think you would put a link to it. And maybe he did somewhere in some other tweet. I don't know. And, but I, I don't know. You think if someone was asking for it, that, that you would share it. And, and I guess maybe a person might assume that if they're too incompetent to be able to f know what VIC is or how to find it or so on and so forth, that they have no business investing alongside you because they're just going to add volatility due to being a weak hand in the mixture and you don't want none of that. Not at all saying that's what he thinks, but it's a thought. I'm speculating here because why would you not put the link? I, I just, I don't quite understand, but nonetheless, so, so there is an article out there. And then there's some articles on Seeking Alpha from like 2021. And then there's a little comment here, a little comment there, and you got to put the pieces of the puzzle all together and then have to know how to search for that. And it's just a whole mess. So there's really no one-stop shop, the best I can tell. So with that tangent out of the way, back to the balance sheet. I will note that their pro forma, due to, be, due to some recent negotiations, will allow them to be liquid, but still insolvent. Them selling their New York business is what will allow them to become solvent. However, as the months go by, I'm not sure if or when that will happen. The above chart touches upon my next concern, uncertain tax liabilities. As you can see right here, uncertain tax liabilities of 26.7 million. Their uncertain tax liabilities are over twice their cash balance or twice their fiscal year 2023 EBITDA. Yet again though, when venturing out into the deeper waters, 
Games such as these should be expected. Personally, I'd prefer my federally legal business to at least pay their federal taxes. To each their own, I suppose. I understand the reasoning behind this strategy, it's just not my preference. Also, it's important to be mindful how paying their taxes affects metrics such as free cash flow or cash flow from operations. They're also trying to claw back $12.3 million of taxes paid between 2020 and 2022. Interestingly enough, it's being claimed as income tax receivable and is being treated as an asset. Ultimately, you're either okay investing in a company doing this or not. Amber had this to say on the Q1 2024 conference call in regards to this matter. Quote, we expect to file for tax refunds with the IRS for tax years 2020 through 2022 during the second quarter, and the state of our balance sheet accounts for an income tax receivable of $12.1 million, as well as an uncertain tax <coughs> position liability of $26.1 million as a result of this change, end quote. Another concern is shareholder dilution. It's better to get in after the, the dilution occurs than before. I'm hoping that soon enough they'll be able to sustain themselves with positive cash flows and the need to dilute their shareholders will stop. But, yeah, hope is in a strategy, isn't that what they say? Here you'll see a recent spike from, oh, we'll just call it 145 million shares to 230 million shares. After all, that's why they're publicly traded. It's in part to raise equity capital. That massive spike up most recently is what the largest shareholder converting all of their convertible notes looks like. It's also what paying a pound of flesh looks like to the tune of 12.5 million shares due to a ninth amendment on their credit facility. But when the options are debt, dilution, or receivership, most will choose the first two. And when the company is practically owned by three entities, you as the marginal shareholder don't have much say. But such risks are expected when playing on this end of the pool. And when the vast majority of shares are locked up by a few concentrated players, it also should be expected that liquidity is going to be rather low and volatile. Here we are talking like nominal value of 9,000. The day I took this screenshot was $8,500 of 18,000 shares. It would only make sense that intraday volatility might be high sometimes. For example, this was pretty recent, a, a 35, almost 36% intraday move. <laughs> that, that's even more volatile. I, I think that's the most, I think this is the most volatile intraday move I've ever experienced with a company I've owned. I think that I was a part of. There's been companies that fell 36% that I then bought the dip in, but, you know, this is different. In a world where people measure risk by volatility, it's no wonder that these types of stocks are considered riskier. The trick is ensuring that the reward is commensurate with that risk. Also, I disagree with the notion that volatility equals risk. But who am I to argue with the VAR bros? Of course, I'm pretty ignorant when it comes to parametric methods and Monte Carlo simulations, so take it for what it's worth. I want to bring up the New York branch of business one more time for emphasis. On April 1st, 2024, Ace Venture Enterprises is supposed to assume the Innovative Industrial Properties IIP lease in Johnstown, New York, Cannabis Cultivation and Manufacturing Campus. <clears throat> the significance of this divestiture is that it'll shed nearly half of the liabilities off of their balance sheet and make them solvent. The problem is that this hasn't happened yet. Not only would it help fix their balance sheet, but it would also save them on interest payments. Quote, sorry, I do not know the source, perhaps Q2 conference call. It says, quote, this is where the sale of the New York assets will be crucial. While we do not expect any meaningful proceeds from the sale, the transaction will allow the company to save over $10 million in interest payments each year. It should also result in meaningful improvements in gross and EBITDA margins, given that the New York market is by far the weakest of the three and almost certainly is not profitable for the company, end quote. To put that in perspective, 
that would afford them a monumental improvement in their cash flows. Although Atlas asked for stronger shoulders and not a lighter load, the burden of New York is quite the weight to bear. Along with them not paying their taxes and the optics that creates for cash flows, it's also wise to recognize that their drone rogue warrants appreciating in value contributed a $1.6 million gain to their EBITDA. Using their 10Q EBITDA figure, this implies that the warrants contributed an extra 20% of EBITDA. This could just as well go in the opposite direction at some point in the future. I will say that as Vario grows, this dynamic should contribute less to their EBITDA reportings and thus less volatility and fluctuation outside of their control. However, if Grown Rogue keeps knocking it out of the park, which I'm largely betting on, these warrants will still make a meaningful difference to Vario's earnings for some time to come. Finally, a disclaimer that needs to be shared more often by me and others. The charts I show don't necessarily reflect the reality of the situation. Oftentimes, they're directionally correct, but can get the magnitude wrong, especially when it comes to EBITDA. And I'm just now realizing that, once again, as I've noted to you all, the viewer before, for some reason, when I transpose my article to the Substack platform, certain images don't pop up. And sure enough, one got left out here, which is a koi fin chart of EBITDA, and then this 10Q image of their EBITDA claim but we just have the 10Q, so bear with me. <coughs> one of these is from Coifran, and one of these is from the SEC 10Q filing. They both agree upon net income, yet differ on EBITDA. Although I'm not following my own advice, I would recommend using the official filings. I'd also recommend that whatever you use, be consistent about it. Either way, be aware of the potential divergence. So this is saying EBITDA is $8.1 million, and I believe the Koi Fin chart claims their EBITDA is $6.15 million. So that's, that's a meaningful difference. So it's either 25% less or 33% more. So that's, that's a large swing in difference. Conclusion. I should note that I have a position, that I have a positive bias towards their CEO. I've rather enjoyed his eclectic writings on Substack. Link in the article. Iced mo Saturday Iced Mochas? Iced Mocha Saturdays is what it's called, something like that. I also enjoy the writings of Jerry Duravani, a partner at Bengal Capital. I think he's one of very few people who actually gets it. Does this create a conflict of interest? No. No, it doesn't. People tend to conflate a potential for a conflict of interest with an actual conflict of interest. But humans are going to human, and this isn't the time or place to further elaborate on such matters. I know I left things out or didn't sufficiently elaborate on other points, both good and bad. For instance, I just realized that after over 3,000 words, I've never once mentioned the Verano lawsuit or how I've spent no time explicitly talking about the Chicago Atlantic Green Ivy credit extension, link in article, although I've noted it implicitly. However, this isn't a one-stop shop for you to consign your investing decisions to me. It's a place to pique your interest and act as a jumping off point, if you so desire. I wrote this article for myself, trying to work through my own thoughts. As is always the case, and as I've noted at the beginning of the genesis of this channel, January 1st, 2023, all of these writings are for me. And then I decided at some point, hey, maybe I should just share them publicly. Why not? They're already written. So that's what I do. Uh, where was I? Yes, I wrote this article for myself, trying to work through my own thoughts. But as far as I'm concerned, I might as well share these thoughts with others to either Compliment, critique, add, or subtract from my work. As often is the case, we jump steps and don't overtly acknowledge information when we think. That's why writing is often so difficult. Today's piece is a good example of how it can still be incomplete and unsatisfactory. Most people have an additive bias. I've written to some extent on this topic in Friction and Fuel. You'll have to read it because I've yet to publish a, a video on it. You have to inverse the problem. What should I subtract away to make things better? 
This is often difficult for people not only because of their additive bias, but also due to ego investments, pride, and sunken cost fallacy. And thus, why new management is often required to turn a ship around. And ta-da, Josh Rosen enters the scene. <clears throat> Vario is a vestigial of what it once was, but in a good way. They're riding the ship. They're a turnaround play and a bet on the underdog. However you want to frame it, they're out there making moves. I'll also note that Vario is both in the MSOS and Toke ETFs. That has to be worth something, right? This isn't a Vario good or bad article. This is a, hey, pay some attention article. I own some myself. Why? Because I think there's some good that I can get comfortable with. Why is it not a large position? Because there are some uncertainties that I can't get comfortable with. The point of today's piece was to get people more up to speed and bring some light to a company that everybody seems to be brushing over. May I remind you of how this article started off? And in this article from February 2022, it ended with saying, quote, it was never an afterthought. Down the line, Minnesota can be an unsung hero in the deal, end quote. Well, guess what? We're now down the line. Thank you for watching and until next time.